One, two, tres, cuatro. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's special guest is retired Sergeant Major Bob Ramsey. Hello, Mr. Ramsey. How are you today? Hi, Jason. Good to see you. So, uh, you know, it's really great that we're able to talk to you on the Zoom. And uh, for those people that don't know, I've known Bob for a long time. Now, what I'd like to say first is some of you may have seen this picture. Oh. Now, this is Bob. It but we'll, is. But we'll get to this part much later on. So could you tell us how many years um, that you be, that you were in Special Forces? I will. I was in there uh, 22 years, uh, almost all of it with SF, but I will cover that in a minute. Uh, but first, I would like to say something uh, concerning you. And Jason mentioned that we've known each other quite a long time, and uh, which is very true. I regard Jason as a, a, a good friend. And he was introduced to me by a man named Gary Robb, who was a beloved brother of mine. You'll hear his name later. Uh, yeah, that's Gary. And uh, so I was a little tentative about uh, Jason at the first, even though Gary was all in. And uh, I forget exactly what that was about. I think it was Jason wanting to make something for the two of us, the RT ass uh, business, which you'll hear about. Um, but then it was not long before there was another person that was attempting to, to jump on Jason's thread here and start a meeting of his own. One of the things that Jason said to that fellow, which has always stuck in my mind, was, hey, it's taken me a long time to gain the trust of these fellas, and if you are not going to mess it up. I don't think he said goodbye. He was more polite. But that always stuck with me. And uh, since that day, uh, he has cultivated ways to uh, ensure that he's getting a uh, a real person for his interviews and his books, The Pucker Factor. And uh, so, Jason, I've said what I wanted to about you. Shall I talk about me a little bit? Thank you. Okay. Well, out of high school, I uh, joined the Army, unassigned. I wanted to go airborne. I, I was just impressed by somebody else coming to town with blouse boots <laughs> and jump wings. So I went in and um, I was assigned to uh, jump school and then the 82nd airborne. Uh, there I was assigned to Division Artillery Fire Support Center. Later they said that they had picked me out for that because I had some certain high scores on my entry uh, level test. But uh, I kind of much believe them. I'll tell you why later is I didn't know anything about SF when I first got there. But once I got through jump school and got it was in uh, division for a while, I started hearing about the 77th Special Forces Group up on Smoke Bomb Hill. And I started looking at that, man, that is impressive. There was no Green Beret or anything. 
It was just a bunch of guys in, in the same field caps that we had in the division. Well, it wasn't long before I got really interested. And um, it was about, I was only about my second year in the Army um, when I applied for Special Forces. It was turned down. It said you had to be an NCO to join Special Forces. And that if I ever made NCO, they liked me, uh, call them again. <laughs> I'd be a little casual about that. Uh, so in the second year, close to the end of the second year, um, they promoted me to buck sergeant. It was a blood strike. Promotions were kind of scarce a few years after the Korean War. And a blood stripe is when somebody is in your company gets busted, they retain the stripe and can give it to whoever they please. Well, they gave it to me and me being very disloyal, I immediately applied for SF and was accepted. So this was right, um, right at when the 77th switched over to the 7th or pretty close anyway, I don't remember exactly the dates. I'm a hard time with date lines now, timelines. So when I got there, there was no training group or training anything. They assigned the ones of us that uh, were uh, entering. We went through a, uh, a special company. I think they called it training company. I believe they did. But we were assigned immediately to uh, uh, companies, and I was assigned to Delta Company. Delta Company was in the business already of, of selecting people that spoke Spanish. And uh, so I was uh, selected for D Company uh, because of that, put on a team, and, uh, and did a lot of cross-training in, uh, in the time that followed up until 1962, uh, when we were alerted for a move to Panama to form the 8th Special Forces Group. Well, I had been promoted to Staff Sergeant uh, in the time that I was waiting to move to, uh, to Panama, so I was pretty happy there. I was a Staff Sergeant, only had a few years in the Army. That was very unusual. So. I arrived in special in uh, eight special forces group and uh, was assigned to uh, a two and uh, that unit was full of so many names that you hear today it was just unbelievable I'm going to top them with Dick Meadows and Dick had was a team sergeant on the uh, team next to us in a two and uh, but he became a fishing and hunting buddy just because of our shared interests. And I got to know Dick quite a bit. And I will say that to this day, my role model is Dick Meadows for his, the way he handles things, the way his life is. He, uh, I have the most respect for him. Uh, it is too bad that he left us so early. That was not fair. So, in 1962, it rolled around and we were just doing training and everything. In fact, I remember the first SEALs uh, came down in 62 to get a jungle orientation. So that's when the SEALs began. Well, in 62, uh, I was called to the bulletin board for something. So I went up there and lo and behold, I had been promoted to E7, Sergeant First Class, the first of the senior Sergeant Majors uh, ranks. I mean, senior uh, enlisted ranks, uh, seven, eight, and nine. Four years in the Army, and I am a, <laughs> I am a Sergeant First Class. Whoa. Well, there was no uh, animosity because of that from anybody. Uh, they all thought it was great. They liked me. I liked them. And uh, we proceeded to do what the 8th Special Forces Group did, which was deploy all over Latin America with mobile training teams. Uh, I did four, if I believe. The ones I liked best were uh, 
Bolivia and Colombia, especially Bolivia, that was a most interesting uh, uh, assignment. And uh, we were up on the Altiplano, if anybody is uh, uh, familiar yes. with that. Uh, my phone's ringing, sorry. Uh, Mitch, I can't talk, I'm on an interview. Thank you. Just, just one thing, Bob, that, sure. uh, that for the public, um, that they can see you on, on film, actually. Um, and that is called the uh, the big, if you go onto YouTube, it's called the uh, Big Picture Army in the Andes. So you can, yeah. you can see Mr. Ramsey there training the uh, locals, which is quite interesting. So that's, if, if yeah. There I was. I think the first shot was me talking uh, to a class with a pointer on a billboard. Looked like I was talking about ambushes. And there I was, the baby starting first class. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, great. Uh, Frank Norberry was a team member. He was a halo pioneer. We got to be uh, the best of friends. Go ahead, Jason. And now on that uh, footage there, um, what I like is that you're training them in, in um, quite a, uh, it's not a desert, but quite a rugged area. And there's like a, a what we would call now is like a kill house where you were training and you had uh you were popping over open the open these targets and you're pulling a rope and then the the individual shooting at them and then you would drop it and then you pull it back up again i thought that was pretty cool to watch that <laughs> yeah we had uh fly by the seat of our pants for a lot of that stuff but uh yeah we trained a ranger battalion and then a lot of the NCOs and officers, we were down there, I don't remember how long we were there, I think six months, I don't remember. Uh, the team leader, John Wagglesign, became a full colonel group commander later on. But yeah, the uh, talking about the terrain, I said the Altiplano or the high plateau of Bolivia, it was just a huge plateau, it was just extremely flat and uh, covered an enormous area. It enclosed Lake Titicaca, which is well known, I think, for people that know uh, geography. And uh, yeah, they had sent a, a, a big picture team down to film some of us. And that's how we got on that site that Jason is talking about. But uh, I believe it was the same. I'm, I'm almost positive the Ranger Battalion that we had was involved in um, uh, Che's death a couple of years later. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was already gone to Vietnam. Yeah, I was explaining um, uh, to my wife, and I'll explain to some of the, the viewers that uh, at that time frame, that Che was probably one of the most wanted men in the world for his uh, terrorist, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, activities, right? He was all over the place. I, I, I just interviewed uh, Jim Hawes, who was a Navy SEAL, and he went to Africa uh, under the umbrella of the uh, CIA and to to the Congo. And guess who was there? Che, right? So he was anywhere that he could get that fire burning of, uh, you know, uprising. He definitely enjoyed that. Well, Jason, he made a huge mistake by coming to Arge Bolivia. And I'll tell you why. Uh, he thought he was going to be well received, but the culture of the Bolivians, regardless of uh, of whether they were uh, Indian or uh, uh, Spanish, Spanish, yep. they did not trust outsiders. I've never seen anything like that. Wow. I'm not sure whether it was because they had a rough dictator at the time or not. But Che needed to get people to support him by coming in. And those people didn't want anything to do with him. And that's how he got himself killed. Uh, they had already infiltrated some things like the radio stations and the, uh, one of the political parties and uh, the media down there. But uh, he thought he was going to just come in and start another uprising. He didn't make it hardly at all before they got him. Big mistake he made. And I know uh, 
and I'm so, sorry to to uh, to it no. there, but um, uh, what was amazing to me is uh, that the CIA agent who was down there and he he actually interrogated Che. He said that when he actually met him, he said there was a small, dirty, raggedy man. I he thought, is this him? Is this the man that that we've been after? And you know, it was. Uh, Apparently, it was quite a pivotal point in that agents uh, or the field field officers as they uh-huh. call them, uh, in his career, and he yeah. he's, he's still alive today in, in Florida. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I think we've all seen the pictures of uh, Jay and his bullet holes. <laughs> and uh, in fact, one of the one of the SF guys from the eighth, one of the officers, got in trouble for getting a picture taken with him and and Che's body. So uh, oh, well. I don't know how he wound up with that, but I know he was in some hot water about it. Wow. So uh, Bolivia was the last time, you see, yeah, the last MTT I went on. Uh, fabulous experience. Uh, and again, Frank Norberry, the halo pioneer, I'll mention him later. Uh, but it was not long after Bolivia when we started getting a few people back from that had served in Vietnam on these short tours, like three months and six months even. And here come these guys. They've got a couple of ribbons and a CIB. Man, what is that stuff about, you know? Oh, that's a real war. That's what we're all about. Everybody got all excited seeing these guys come in. Well, I had a best friend or he developed into a best friend, gone now. Uh, but uh, he talked about, he had spent a, a bit on an A-team, but talked about liking the Mike Force. And uh, so I was all excited about the Mike Force, and I'll tell you who they were. But I applied for a direct um, assignment to Vietnam from overseas. So from overseas, briefly in the States and on to Vietnam. And uh, I wanted to go to the two core Mike force. And that was, uh, I think the two core, there was a four cores starting with the most Northern area was the first core, then two core, the central highlands. And that's where I wanted to go. Uh, So we managed, my friend and I managed to get assigned to B company who the Mike force was under. And we went up to the uh, uh, B company and uh, and told the boss, a lieutenant colonel, we would like to go to the Mike Force. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, Mike Force is probably taking just people who have previous uh, experience over here. My friend had already been in Vietnam on an A team, but no Mike Force. But I'll send you both over there. I said, okay, so we both go over there, and the captain that was the boss at the time uh, interviewed both of us, accepted me, and didn't accept my friend who had fear experience. We joked about my friend and I that later. Um, and, uh, and I was given the team sergeant position, even as an SFC. I had, had a, a few years in grade, but uh, nevertheless, I was... Uh, the team sergeant of A219 stayed that way for my time there. I managed to spend the whole year over there. And uh, but the Mike Force, for those of you that don't know, uh, was the uh, white hat, the cavalry that came to the rescue of anything gone bad. So we went all over. The mission was to go all over two corps, a pilot that was downed. Uh, a patrol in trouble, an A camp being seized. So everything when we were deployed as a Mike Force unit was uh, the things were already probably heated up hot in some cases. So, uh, and that was, I actually uh, got my first look at actual combat uh, being deployed in support of the 4th Infantry Division. And uh, I learned, and it was funny because it, this big battle, which was later written up by S.L.A. Marshall in a book, uh, 
it was a pretty big thing. And uh, we were vastly outnumbered by the NVA. No Viet Cong. I never saw a Viet Cong in my whole time over there. was always NVA. But the NVA really, uh, really had us in uh, dire straits there. 11 November 1966, Veterans Day. <laughs> How ironic, you know. And I'll always remember Veterans Day as, a, as such a special day. But so that was what the Mike Four was about until the group commander, uh, whose call, name, call sign name was Blackjack, decided that he wanted to try out a new idea, the Mobile Guerrilla Force. The Mobile Guerrilla Force was supposed to be, and it was initially, a full A-team, uh, a full uh, rifle company, like 120 guys, uh, whatever communications methods you wanted, equipment, whatever weapons you wanted, uh, whatever you wanted, period. But you were to be deployed in or behind one of the big uh, base areas that the NVA or the yeah NVA secured, and you were supposed to stay there a couple of months. Well, right away, anybody with two brain cells knew, oh, you're going, we're going to be bait, you know. Yeah. But we were supposed to conduct their tactics against them, you know, raids, ambushes. Uh, breaking up commo lines, taking down messengers, anything we could do to irritate them, make them form against us in a cyber force where they could use conventional infantry against them or air. And uh, we were always out of range of the artillery. So, so air was the biggest support. And man, we all love the Air Force. And... Uh, so the, the uh, mobile guerrilla force operation was known as a blackjack because of the group commander's call sign. So the first one was tested and uh, it worked out pretty good. So Yahoo, here we go. We're going to send in one out in every core area. One of the things that we got, uh, which was really innovative, I think, was how we got resupplied because we were not going to get resupplies like the regular infantry with helicopters bringing us water, bringing us food, bringing us whatever we wanted. We could not have helicopter support. We were supposed to be completely um, hidden back in that area. Wow. So uh, I don't know who came up with this idea but napalm containers, napalm containers would be filled with medical supplies, ammo, whatever you happen to need. And they would be hooked to the wings of the A1Es. And there would be three or four of the A1Es come flying over our area. And then one of the uh, A1Es would start heading towards our drop zone which we had designated, and the other A1Es would fly around the area, drop in real napalm to uh, attract attention on those strikes rather than uh, on us. And they would come in, the uh, they would release the napalm containers. There was a little drogue chute to keep them from blowing up when they hit the ground. It worked perfect. And so we got that stuff out and uh, booby trap the containers and uh, which I mean, later on we could hear them going off kaboom kaboom um, those really worked good but uh, some of the things were you know kind of rough on people um, if you got sick you pretty much got sick and did the keep on going the SF way uh, one of the worst things to me was water you know, we had to find our own water. We got food through the napalm containers, but no water. And sometimes the water would be running, and sometimes we'd have to scrape stuff off the top to get it. Oh. And I'm sure we drank tadpoles and, you know, God knows what out of that. But everybody got pretty sick. I got uh, uh, amoebic dysentery. Wow. And um, 
and stayed at least another month in there. Um, another thing interesting happened to me was that uh, the boss and I had been taken in uh, mid-mission to the first CAVS headquarters because they want us to, to work in a different area. The first CAV was the one that had a battalion on standby if we need it. So that was a connection with the first CAV. And that was one time that the helicopters came in to get uh, us back to the uh, boss. So team sergeant and team leader went back to see what they wanted. And the chopper landed, and we both got a Jeep. And this Jeep had these, these things that provided an overhead cover if you wanted a frame. Well, somehow I got my hand stuck in that frame, and I said, oh, I just broke some bones. I did. While we were at the first cab, we went over to their, uh, their hospital, and they x-rayed it while we were there. Yep, broken. They put it in a cast and put a tag on me to return uh, south for further medical. Well, the medic had accompanied me. We went out of this tent and we immediately threw the tag away. I wrapped up the, the cast with green tape, duct tape that did everything, didn't it? <laughs> and so I, it was my right hand. So boy, did I fall down a lot of hills and stuff like that with that cause of that cast because it went over my hand and there was no grasp or anything. But we had a picture taken after the uh, mission that you can still see that, that white cast. So anyway, um, I did the last mission, the last blackjack I went on had been downsized to four Americans and a platoon, whoa. And they deployed us up when Doc Toe had gotten hot. And the 173rd was up there sending down bodies by the truckload because of the NVA on the other side of the valley. Well, we, I say the other side because we were deployed on the other side, not the side the, uh, of Doc Toe and Hill 875 and all that was uh, located. But they wanted to know if there were any any NVA, NVA on uh, on the other side, you know, that was going to do some kind of trap or whatever they intended to do. Uh, but it was um, we found some NVA, but uh, it was not their headquarters or anything, and it wasn't a big unit, uh, so uh, they were pretty much done in by air, and uh, because we had been. Uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for, Jason? We've been exposed. Okay. Uh, yep. They went ahead and pulled us out. And that was like in uh, November of 67. Uh, My tour was up. I went back home. I went back to the 7th. I was assigned to uh, Echo Company. And for the next two years, I trained with... Um, uh, Echo Company of the 7th, and then got orders for um, Vietnam again. That's how I wound up in MACB SOG. So yeah. just, to, just to pause you there, because sure. I, know I have seen many photographs of uh, like a, a group, you know, photographs where the men of Mike Force had beards. So I was talking to you <laughs> off camera and uh, you know, there's two things. Number one, you told me, and I've seen the pictures where you're you were out there for so long that your that your uniforms were actually falling apart, and that you had grown beards. So the group pictures that you see of Mike Force are taken after you guys got back, and that's why you guys are are un, unshaven. Correct. That's absolutely right. And we also brought back a couple of things beside the beards skin fungus and everybody came down with that horrible you know but I, I, I don't really want to ask but I, I guess I should ask what what is that skin fungus is a, a terrible rash and it's always located in places where you know there's close skin to skin contact like your arm fats your groin right and um, and and those were very nasty they 
you would people generally scratch them to bleed him and um and i it took me years after vietnam to get rid of those wow and yeah they were always a, a long lasting problem and uh they would disappear for a while and then come roaring back they were a nightmare i've met them for a long time now many yeah a long long time but uh yeah they were they were problems because I know, or, or most people don't know, that um, uh, in the jungle, there's so many things that can make you very sick. Or, you know, once you get a cut from that, from that long grass, the elephant grass, it, it can get infected. You can get, like you said, you know, the skin fungus. Um, uh, you know, you can get like a uh, trench foot or that kind of thing. And then you have all the mosquitoes and all the insects and everything else that, that's trying to kill you. There's not just the enemy that's trying to get you, right? Oh, correct. <laughs> everything over there bit. <laughs> and, uh, one of the worst things that people hated were the leeches. And uh, there were two kinds of leeches we encountered. There was a big, fat, ugly thing that lived in the water, but we didn't, we didn't encounter those much. Where we did every time, all day long and at night, uh, land leeches they would come awesome. marching to you like an inchworm does detecting the heat of your body and then if you didn't have some way of keeping them off you with like mosquito repellent uh, or your clothes blouse so tightly they couldn't get in they'd find a way and at night oh you people would walk up wake up with them hanging on their neck or face and that area really bled a lot. But those leech bites would um, uh, would get infected too. And that leech would get on you and it secreted an anticoagulant yeah. so that it could uh, fasten on to you and get blood flow out of that. Nasty little devils. And um, uh, Agent Orange. Uh, we drank Agent Orange every time we drank the water. We had been through many areas that had obviously had Agent Orange in them. Um, it was uh, a lot of guys came down with cancer because of that from my team and died from it. Wow, for, I guess I didn't have the DNA marker for it or something. Uh, at least up to this point in my life, I've not had any kind of cancer at all. Wow. Uh, but there was another insect that I always like to tell people about because people seem, guys that have been over there seem to be surprised by that. But in the central highlands, and once you get out of the lower areas and you're in a lot of mountains and ridges and that kind of stuff, a little bit of altitude, you'd be walking along. And here came this big, it would always fly by itself like a giant bumblebee. And it would always go for somebody's head. And we didn't wear helmets or anything. So that thing would land on, it, I never got me, but it sure got some other people. Boy, the little mountain yards really hated that thing. It was, the pain was excruciating when that thing landed and, and stung you. <clears throat> <clears throat> I have another story that while we're talking about that kind of thing, if we have time, do we, Jason? We have as much time as you want. As I was uh, saying, and I'll say to the audience too, that when we have a, a special guest like Bob, that uh, we're not going to fit it into one to one hour. So we'll be having you, a go we've got half an hour left of this first one, but we're going to have you on again anyway to go into more depth about what we can't fill in today. So yes, please go ahead with any story. Okay, perfect. I, I like that schedule. I, uh, I've only done one other interview, and that was at Soar when their their historian interviews. But that was about something else. Uh, so where was I at the bumblebee? And um, another story that I always remember was a medic on the team, Peter Holmberg. Oh yeah. Okay, his name is well known. He was my junior medic. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, went on to become a sergeant major himself in quite a, a career. And uh, Peter always um, 
he, he told me not long before he died, he got bad Parkinson's and then the end of his life, he had this brain tumor that was just killing him with pain in ICU. And Charlotte, his wife, would uh, call me and tell me how bad Pete's pain was. And somewhere along there, he had the ability to say, thank you, Bob, uh, for being my mentor. Well, I, I remember that so much. And there was another guy on the team that uh, did that was Ken McMullen. He was a junior engineer, demo man. He told me the same thing. And from his hospital uh, room on, uh, on Fort Bragg, Fort Bragg, Womack Army Hospital, and he died of cancer. He had a fantastic career. He had gone on to uh, a team with Max Sog, <clears throat> was on the Sante raid, and uh, he, he was just a super, super soldier. <clears throat> he said the same thing. Thanks, Bob. You were an inspiration for me or something like that. Very flattering kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, this story with Peter Holmberg, uh, one of the yards, the interpreter came uh, and said, we have to get so-and-so out. He is dying. Oh, yeah? What's he dying of? Um, because we hadn't had any action that day or anything. Oh, he's got heart leech. Oh, what is a heart leech? He said, it gets on your neck and it uh, goes from your neck to your heart and kills you. Oh, really? Never heard about that guy. Can you bring him up here? And uh, the interpreter goes and gets the guy. And, um, and th this guy was like beside himself with his, he's going to die about his family, the lava. He had a leech bite on his neck and it got real swollen. And uh, so after trying to negotiate something with this situation, I finally got the idea of getting the medic involved. So Peter comes up and between the two of us, we learned about this heart leech and we discovered that we had the cure for it. And he injected it with sterile water. And lo and behold, it killed the heart leech. And the guy went on to be an excellent rifleman. <laughs> I love that story. And um, so that was, that was one of the stories I remember so well from the uh, mobile guerrilla force stuff. There are a lot of stories, but those really have always stood out with me for some reason. And so, it might be because those two guys had flattered me so much. I don't know what you were to say. At this point, um, you know, a lot of, uh, at this point during Mike Force and uh, that kind of time frame, uh, did you did you always take, you know, U.S., uh, you know, weapons or did you carry a sidearm? Oh, okay. Good question. I like the, those kind of things. Yes. Great question. Uh, reminded me to talk about a Sten gun, but we had been issued M16s. The first time out in that big battle I mentioned a little while ago, we had World War II weapons. We were totally outweaponed by the NVA. Wow. But after that, we have M16s. All of our troops had M16s. All Americans uh, got carbines uh, that, uh, not carbine, wasn't it? The commando, but, the Colt, the, the Colt commando, the shortened ver version. The short version of the yeah, MCG. Yeah. Thank you. Had a name. Car and we all selected those. Nobody went for any kind of exotic weapon except that Sten gun thing. And that was my fault. And uh, uh, I didn't carry it. Nobody carried sidearms. Um, you know, the loads we took out into the, the jungle. You know, we didn't carry these big rucksacks I see nowadays. We didn't have anything like that. I doubt if we had 25 pounds of stuff beside the ammo. And, uh, you know, it was, we had to have uh, lower weights. That's not the way I should say it. We, we should not be burdened by heavy weights that didn't do anything. Like right. I joked with you about breaking a toothbrush in half. Right. But um, 
Yeah, that uh, uh, all the that took us up to the point of the Sten gun story. I was so enchanted by the Sten gun. Oh man, that what? Oh God, that was like James Bond stuff or something like that. Well, I was given the recon platoon uh, as the uh, platoon leader for uh, our organization. It was standard rifle company kind of. Uh, rifle platoons and a recon platoon. Um, and uh, we didn't have any LLDB, the, the uh, Vietnamese special forces equivalent. I understand all the other Mike forces had them. We didn't have anything. We were the bosses, the gringos. The, uh, the, we were the bosses. So I had the recon platoon. So we're going to give the, the recon platoon a, a couple of them, these Sten guns. And in addition, uh, I was going to have them uh, do like a Delta uh, type operation or maneuver of making, dressing them as uh, in NBA clothing and letting them go out a good ways in front of us uh, on trails to see if, and we didn't walk on trails, of course, but we wanted them to walk on trails. <clears throat> well, it didn't take me, uh, excuse me, we might <laughs> have to conclude this after this, but uh, might be a good time to break, but not yet. <clears throat> uh, the Sten gun, when no, you know, here you are in this jungle and everything really is deadly quiet, you know, and there's just no noise being made. And, you know, I mean, other than a few birds or something like that, for the most part. And the Sten gun fired. It was a blowback weapon. And, man, that bolt clang, clang, clang. You could have heard it for 10 miles. And I said, oh, my God. You know, after, after the first use of that thing, I said, you know, <laughs> we're getting rid of that. And we undress those guys, put them back in their regular uniforms and gave them a, an M16 and put them back in the uh, recon platoon. I didn't even use them out front anymore like that. But we did have the standard security, you know, the out front to the sides and, and that kind of thing. And I was responsible for, for, for those in the recon platoon. Uh, but anyway, uh, those are some of them. That was a good question. Could you think of any other great questions about those well, operations. I mean, I mean, what I would say is uh, to the, the new you know, listener to uh, these kind of interviews is that as Bob is telling us that noise is you want to keep to like a minimum, but also, of course, the jungle can be noisy, but any kind of uh, metal sounding noise is not going to be from a jungle noise. It's going to attract yeah. attention. Any kind good of point belt noises or or you know you know water can you know canteens i mean i guess they were plastic probably with you guys right probably probably yeah. plastic. but any kind of bolt action or like uh you know um, bob selling us um so uh you know um other things to ask um did the indig did they get uh, special meals because i know that in sog that they got later on they got rationed more you know, appropriate meals for indig. They got their rice. They got their their um, you know their fish uh, and all that kind of stuff. So did uh, did the indig or, or did you ever go hunting for for any wildlife when you were in the bush? You know, just to kind of <laughs> to add any extra meat. <laughs> no, no, no. And we had standard uh, indig rations. It, it can, let's see, there's a fish and squid, a dried minnows and squid. That was my favorite. And uh, we had a, uh, a sausage and we had a shrimp and mushroom. All these things were dried and reconstituted with water. And speaking about loads that you carried, a lot of the weight we carried was water. Uh, because we didn't know when we'd uh, find the next water. You know, it's kind of reminiscent of the people that opened the West, you know, when when they, you can't live without water. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, not knowing what's in front of you, water-wise, you 
make sure you had a lot of water. Rarely did we run out. We had great water discipline. But an interesting thing happened about those indige rations. They were great. Everybody liked them. We Americans liked them. I can't remember exactly the other ones, but that's good enough. You fill them with water. And it also had a bag of dried rice that you reconstituted. And there was little packets of the hottest little chilies you ever heard of in there. And uh, no cigarettes like sea rations or something like that. But uh, uh, that was pretty much one of their packets. And um, everybody got, you know, those were okay. But after we'd been out there a good while, I'm going to say a month, uh, we started noticing, I think, I think the one that came to me was Peter, uh, noticing uh, people started like showing uh, fatigue that was not normal. And so to make a long story short, we had decided that that had something to do with their diet. So we, in the next uh, napalm container uh, series, we got a bunch of sea rations, the, the meat issues and, uh, and things like that, and gave their people, and it made a difference. You know, it was, um, it was uh, quite, a, quite a solution, I thought, uh, to discover that Peter Holmberg to his credit. And, uh, and that's exactly what it seemed to be. Because uh, I, I, do, I do, I do know another aspect of that is because they were dried fruit, uh, sorry, dried uh, food that uh, that the indige didn't quite understand about mixing uh, water with it, and it would really bloat their stomachs because, of course, then it's pulling the moisture from your bowels, and it caused stomach issues because they weren't, uh, you know, they weren't using enough water to actually hydrate the. Uh, the, uh, the the food parcels but you know that was never an issue with us jason uh no that was never an issue uh and uh you know i can think of some other things like all the complaints about the m16 when it first was issued right. you know not just from all the surgeons all these complaints oh it's a horrible weapon it fires and jams and stuff like that it turned out to be strictly a maintenance thing as far right. as we were concerned. Clean your weapon like we uh, taught them to, and you didn't have those issues. At least that was our experience with, uh, uh, with it. Uh, Charlotte's handed me a note. <laughs> you you flash. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so we... we We've got 15, 15 more minutes here. So um, did you or any of your guys when you were on Mike Force ever take like a like an AK-47 with you or was, was that not on the menu at that point? Good question. I meant to bring that up. Yeah, you hear about a lot of these people uh, on other teams and other units in SF and stuff like that making these rather uh, different kinds of weapons. And, uh, you know, that was their business is everything. We did not do that. AK was a formidable weapon, don't get me wrong, but just the magazines empty were heavy, the ammunition was heavy, and worst was it was a different kind of ammunition than what most people had. Right. So no, everybody carries the same kind of ammunition. Nobody's going to carry exotic weapons with us. And that reminds me of something else. I think you, you asked me this the other day about, about SF or I guess you were asking me about SF, about doing things like cutting off ears and things like that. You know, that was an absolute no-no in, uh, in third company. You did not do anything to disrespect a body. And, um, and we didn't. I would have known. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't. Now, so, when, now, one thing: uh, when you were a young man, you were what six foot two? Is that right? Is that what you said to me? No, six foot even. Six foot even. Okay, so most of the just so so the listeners realize, 
now the indig guys i mean what would you say would be their average height uh probably five four or five with an occasional tall one yeah so i mean them carrying i mean and they would have to carry the same load that you would i would assume yes so i mean that's that much harder for a smaller man right so a heavier weapon a heavier magazine um, you know, like you said, I mean, and the joke about the, you know, cutting the uh, toothbrush in half it is not really a joke because even the smallest thing adds up, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And yeah, they pretty much were stuck with the same loads, but they were, they were able to do this. And, um, you know, contrary to their culture that did not carry loads like that, you know, they did not do that. So that was foreign to them to put a load on their back, mm. which brings up another thing about the Mike Force and my tour there was in Panama, bef before I left Panama, one of the things that I had been a participant of was teaching uh, uh, South American officers, putting them through a jump school. And we set up a jump school uh, in the canal zone. And uh, so I was quite familiar with running a jump school. And uh, my boss knew that about me. So the orders came down from group to airborne train the two core mic force. And I knew how to do that. And we set up a, a jump school and we put everybody through it. And uh, they, they just, uh, liked it for the most part we didn't ever have to push anybody out the door <laughs> and uh but imagine what they were thinking a lot of these guys were having a hard time finding out what an airplane was why is that thing flying in the sky how does it do that is it scary or what you know and now you're going to get in the belly of the thing and and jump out when you, what in the world are you asking me to do they took right to it, but I bring that up because it was another thing that was against their uh, culture that we grew up doing things like uh, baseball, throwing and catching stuff and uh, jumping and uh, all the things that we did, playing baseball, all the different kinds of sports like that. Our coordination was completely foreign to our mountain yards. And... Uh, one of the things that we ran into running the jump training was how to do a parachute landing fall, you know, and uh, it was initially, man, it was so, it was comic to watch them try it, you know, and, uh, but you had to keep a straight face and demonstrate how better how to do it and everything. Well, they all, they all finally got on to it and they all got five jumps and um, and they also had a jump after I had left there some years later um, where they claimed it was a combat jump, but that was kind of one of those funny combat jumps where the DZ was secured and uh, they had Kool-Aid ready for them, that kind of thing. You know? And uh, I, I didn't think it was a real combat jump. It wasn't counted as one anyway. Um, so yes. one, so one other aspect is that uh, you know again for for the new people listening about uh, the Vietnam War is that the indigenous troops uh, depending where they I mean any indigenous people that they were not liked by the north or or the south and they um, they were they were picked on and even after the Vietnam War that the that the yards were uh, you know picked on and uh, you know brutalized right they Jason were subject to discrimination that the people in the United States would have a hard time believing. They took cry race and discrimination in this country. They have no idea. And not just in Vietnam, in all the countries that I uh, saw, and usually working with one of the, the subcultures, right. I saw that kind of discrimination. Bolivia, I just talking about the Quechua Indian, the Aymara Indian, not a chance. Yeah, the mountain yards uh, were discriminated against by the Vietnamese and 
they didn't, the mountain yards did not like them either, or the north, like you said. Yeah. Uh, in fact, our lead interpreter, a man named Bado, was a tall, handsome, good looking mountain yard. I have his picture on my wall. The most important individual to me I think I'll ever meet. This guy was so intelligent. He spoke uh, French fluently. He spoke English pretty fluently and several dialects, uh, the mountain yard dialects. This guy was um, singled out by the LLDB as somebody that was dangerous to the Vietnamese. And uh, they were afraid that he had been too involved with a mountain yard political arm as it, uh, organization called Foro. That's in French, and I can't tell you what it is. But uh, he was a big figure in that. In fact, he got to be the the uh, head of it. After we smuggled him out into Cambodia, after learning that they had a death warrant on him. Wow. So we slipped him across into Cambodia. He joined up full row and, and went on uh, with uh, the political uh, arm of the mountain yards until the uh, Cambodian uh, military learned of him and they took him under wing and gave him a commission as a major and uh, put him in their army. Now, what a great story with this guy. I mean, that right there tells you how amazing this guy was. The next time I saw him, I was walking down the halls in Fort Benning of Infantry Hall, and I hear, Ramsey, I'll look around, it's Bob Doe. And he's in a uniform, and he, the Cambodian army thought he was so important to send him to the United States through Fort Benning, the advanced course. Wow. Wow, what a guy. Well, the Khmer Rouge knew about him too. Because after he returned to, um, I took Bado home to my home in Fayetteville, by the way, and showed him all kinds of different gringo stuff. You know, he was amazed at everything. And, uh, but he went back and uh, rejoined a, a Cambodian machine. And the Khmer Rouge had gotten so uh, successful that they surrounded this. Gabo took his family into a, uh, I think it was a French embassy, took his family in there, Khmer Rouge surrounded it, said, Bado, you bring your family out here or we're going to kill everybody in the damn building, including you and your family. Bado took his family outside and they were immediately executed. Oh. Uh, horrible story, I know. Uh, but the most amazing individual that anybody could run into. He was just so nice and so, and he could, in that battle that I first talked about, 11 November, right. he was shot through the neck. It, I, I saw him in, in a, a few minutes, I saw him stand up, and this is in the, a lot of incoming fire. He pick, throws down his... Uh, web gear he threw down his weapon he picked up a little stick and he walked around hitting different people that he didn't think were firing shot through the neck he did that now obviously it didn't hit his spine or a juggler ruin but he talked in a rough voice ever since then he survived that wound and went out in the field with us he was on mole griffith's operations uh, several times there Bado, what an amazing man! You see, here here's the thing that's that that I want younger people to know, um, and that is, history should never be altered to appeal to to the masses. Here's Bob telling us about a very personal story 
and now that man's life and his family's life lives on. But if Bob felt that the viewers wouldn't be able to handle listening to it, we'd never know about it. So history is not always pleasant, but people like Bob's friend here should not should not be forgotten. So it's thank you for sharing that story. Sure. Now, well said, Jason. Well said. So we've got five minutes left here. Now, this is kind of something a little bit different for me. In the next installment, which we'll try and do next week or as soon as you're free, we're going to discuss your transition from Mike Force and the Mobile Strike Force into McPhee's SOG. So right. what what could be some cliffhangers that, uh, you know, because they always do this in the TV shows now, we're going to really just gently touch on this, that you were involved in the first operation of this type with, with RT ASP. So can you just give on just, just a, just a hint of that? Maybe tell us, yeah. how, maybe tell us how, how low you were when you guys jumped out, um, out of the plane. No, I'm not going to share that yet. I'm going to okay. save that one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you want a little uh, a little teaser? Yes. Yeah, RTS was one of the recon teams in command and control north, part of Max Sog B. We were responsible for across the border operations in Laos and the, the military zone, and um, RTS was just one of of the teams there. He was led by Captain uh, Gary Robb, who you were showed a little picture of. And uh, never before had there been a uh, command and control north that ever tried to insert anybody with a parachute. Uh, and RTS got to do that. It was a historic thing. And I am really looking forward to telling you about it. But uh, you're going to have to listen to Jason's second installment <laughs> you know, uh, to get that. So while we cut it off, Sure. At, the, at the point where I uh, leave Fort Bragg and headed back to Vietnam. Okay. So thank you very much, Mr. Ramsey, for taking this time. And uh, I really enjoy the stories that you share. You're very clear and there's really a good mixture of uh, uh, heartfelt stories and uh, some, you know, combat sort of things and the, the insects and the, you know, the <laughs> rashes. It's a good, good uh, mixture. So thank you again. Well, thank you, my friend.